Welcome to Your Gal Friday, a podcast about female leaders, innovators, and rule breakers. Each week, your hosts, Kate and Phoebe, will shine a spotlight on an amazing gal and talk about what we can all learn from her. Brought to you by Gal's Guide to the Galaxy. Welcome to Your Gal Friday. I'm Kate Chaplin. And I'm Phoebe Freer. Today we're talking about a gal who is known as the mother of social work. She founded the template for what is now the modern day YMCA or Boys and Girls Club. Her settlement is known as Hull House and it utilized the neighborhood for social and civic change. She was a pacifist and an activist for peace. And in 1931, she was the first American woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. Today we're going to talk about the life and legacy of your gal, Jane Addams. Jane Addams is very interesting to me this week because I actually really haven't heard of her before, but she's done so much and so many things that there's no real reason why I shouldn't have heard of her, but I had no idea. I I was clueless going in on this one. This week I actually kind of had a little bit of trouble connecting with her because she's just done so much and it was kind of like reading a history, uh, history book, like it's kind of overwhelming, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, and then she did this, and then in, in such and such a date, she did this, and then did this. And I was like, oh my goodness, I, how do I process this and <laughs> like humanize her, you know? But um, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it was kind of hard to digest for me, but I, I think that we've uh, found a nice connection and, and we'll make it be digestible for other people because there's just so much to process. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We're going to find the the person in the history book. Totally. (laughs) Bring her to life a little bit. Uh, What I knew about Jane was just a a tiny bit more. I mean, I I do presentations at schools and Jane Addams is one of the ladies that I talk about the presentations. Um, When I do this presentation, I keep it really interactive. Um, So I show pictures. I show pictures of two different gals and then I read a short biography about them and I have the students guess if I am talking about the gal in photo number one or photo number two. Um, I have them use their deduction skills. And of course, based on the grade level, sometimes it's really easy. Sometimes it's a picture of Sally Ride in her astronaut uniform. And the clue is, this gal is an astronaut. (laughs) Right. (laughs) But sometimes it's two ladies of science and the years they lived will kind of be a a clue of whether I'm talking about a video game designer or I'm talking about the very first computer programmer. So it's a really fun program and the kids actually really get into it. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. It's really fun because you're just guessing, you know, is it number one or number two? And it's kind of like you're it's okay to not know anything about the photo but to listen and to be like the clues okay with the clues maybe right. I can figure out it's kind of like the guess who game you know with totally. the little photos yeah Do they that's have like one of my glasses? favorite games ever that's really cool <laughs> It's kind of that, but with famous ladies of history. That's awesome. Uh, But at the end, I asked them, who did they already know about? And uh, who did they just learn about today and would like to know more about? And Coco Chanel is actually very popular because they know of her name. (laughs) Right. So they are very curious about her. Uh, But there's also a few uh, Jane Addams mentions uh, that were, you know, just learned about her and were very much taken by her. So I really only knew that quick little bio history right. uh, so I've actually been looking forward to this episode to kind of dig in even more to like basically you know spend some time with Jane and uh, oh. and learn about her history so Phoebe you have been researching this with me mm-hmm. where did Jane grow up well Jane actually grew up in Cedarville Illinois that's where she was born um, she was born in September 6 1860 she was actually the youngest out of eight and when she was eight years old, she actually lost four of her siblings already. So it was down to just four of them left. And um, when she was two, she lost her mother as well. So she kind of already experienced a lot of loss in her life. Absolutely. Sad. Yeah. Yeah. Jane was a tomboy growing up and she was a a daddy's girl, which I can totally relate with. Me too. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So she, like, played outside and played, um, like, climbed trees and stuff, and she read avidly while she was inside, and then she attended Sunday school and was really religious, and she just all around loved to learn. So when Jane was only four, she contracted tuberculosis in her spine, which is also known as Pott's disease. 
This unfortunately gave her a curvature in her spine and also gave her a limp. So she couldn't actually run as well as the other kids outside and she dealt with health problems for the rest of her life because of it. Mm. Yeah. So like I said before, Jane adored her father and I mean like adored him. And she was very, very proud of everything he was doing and she was very supportive and with good reason. Um, Jane's father was named John Huey Adams and he was an agricultural businessman, and he was also the president of the Second National Bank of Freeport. He remarried in 1868 when Jane was eight years old. His second wife was called Anna, and she was also a widower. So John Adams was also a founding member of the Illinois Republican Party, and he served as an Illinois state senator from 1855 until 1870. So get this. On top of all of that, Jane's father actually also supported his friend, the one and only Abraham Lincoln. Yep, that's right. So Jane's dad and Abraham Lincoln were best buds, and um, he helped Abraham Lincoln run for both senator and then eventually presidency, which is super cool. That is very, very cool. Yeah. I love that. So Jane actually spent her life believing that she was ugly because of her tuberculosis and her disease in the spine and because she had this limp and she, but she really adored and loved her father and she wanted him to look good. So it's actually said that she would walk on the opposite side of the street as him when he was dressed up in his Sunday best, which is like so sweet and sad and I just want to hug her. Yeah. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Oh. I mean, it's kind of incredible what self-esteem, low or high, can actually do to a person. Yeah, absolutely. So Jane actually had a big heart, and she had a lot of empathy for others. Um, when she was a teen, she actually had big dreams for her life. Had those dreams after reading books and watching her mother's kindness and her father's major accomplishments. Jane decided that she wanted to help other people, and the poor in particular. She kind of decided on a whim that the best way that she could serve other people was becoming a doctor. So she endeavored to go to school for medicine. And her father encouraged her to actually attend college closer to home to start. And so that's what she did. So, Kate, yeah. what, does, what does her college life look like? She went to Rockford Female Seminary and she graduated in 1881. And there she met Ellen Gate Starr, who would actually become her good friend and for a time her partner. Yes. So the summer, though, after graduation, her father died unexpectedly from appendicitis. She and her siblings, though, did inherit $50,000, which is the equivalent to today of $1.24 million. Oh, wow. That's kind of a big deal. <laughs> she had a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, she moved to Philadelphia to attend the Women's Medical College of Philadelphia. She completed her first year of medical school before really bad health problems and actually also a nervous breakdown oh. caused her to leave school and to move back to Cedarville. Yeah. Her brother-in-law performed surgery on her back in attempts to try to straighten it. He then also advised her to forget school and to travel instead. Well, that's interesting. And we're kind of mixed about this, whether or not, yeah, he was being, oh, don't bother, it's too right. hard for you. I don't know how I would <laughs> feel if somebody, like, told me that. With a, like, Because with Jane, we don't really have the context of why she was told, oh, don't go to school, you should travel. Like, on one hand, that's, that's right. cool. I dig traveling. Like, traveling is one of my top favorite things to do ever. But I also right. want... Right, and she had the means to do so. Did. But I also like having an education and, you know. Fulfilling a life's dream. Right, yeah. exactly. So, like, did he say it as in, like, oh, you're not good enough to be a doctor, so you should just go travel? Or did he, like, say it knowing her condition, say it out of his well-being for her or something? Right, long hours on your feet with back problems, right. being a doctor, would it impair you from actually being able to do your job as a doctor? Right, exactly. Like, did he see that Maybe comment? he Maybe knew he that. Maybe he knew that. Maybe he was just, you know, I would like to think that he was just looking out for her. So, I don't know. I'm just kind of mixed. Like, it's so cool that she yeah. um, traveled, though, because that radically changed her life. 
Yeah, absolutely. So starting in August of 1883, Jane traveled Europe for two years, actually. Wow. Uh, she went with various family and friends, including Ellen Starr. And when she came back, though, she really hit home uh, with the feeling of the pressure of her future. Wow. Uh, she did not want the life of a well-to-do woman. So she was like, what in the world do I do? Right. <laughs> Now, this is the period of her life that I actually find the most interesting and the one I really relate to. She knows what she wants to be. She wants to be a doctor. Right. She goes to school close to home to appease her dad. Her dad dies. She becomes wealthy by inheritance. She goes away to college, but her body fails her. So she travels to find herself, but then she comes back to the same problems that she left. So the way that I relate is I wanted to be a filmmaker, um, and my dad wanted me to stay close to home to go to school as well. Now, unlike Jane, I moved away to California, and my father is still alive and well. Right, exactly, yeah. (laughs) Very Very, important distinction. Very important difference here. (laughs) Now, I had problems in college. It wasn't health-wise, but living in Los Angeles is monstrously expensive. And I was working 50 hours a week just to make enough money to pay the rent and to eat. Uh, And I felt like I had to choose between school and food. And now I say this ironically because I am a big girl now. (laughs) (laughs) But I was a stick bean then and could use any amount of nourishment. Right. (laughs) But I also thought that school would make me a filmmaker but I soon learned that I didn't have to go to college to be a filmmaker I simply had to make films so I did I quit school with the intention of writing and making films but I didn't do it right away because I was still struggling with that permission aspect in life that uh am I worthy of my dreams so really in other words when the problems that I had when I left home I still had in Los Angeles they were still there and they were still holding me back and it wasn't until I dealt with those was I able to finally start making films so I related this a lot to to Jane's part of this of her life of kind of trying to find herself um, and still struggling after two years abroad you know traveling still like who am I what am I going to be what am I going to do so when Jane had actually came back from her two-year-long tour of Europe she decided that she did not have to become a doctor to help the poor I mean, this kind of makes me wonder, though, if she decided this because she was physically unable to, or if she really felt this desire and this passion that this was what she needed to do, because she didn't know what she was going to do instead of being a doctor right away. She had this period of time where she was kind of up in the air, like, what do I do? How do I... How do I help? You know, that kind of thing. Right. It's a big decision. It is. It really, really is. And... Um, After she came home, she sank into this deep depression until she actually found her real passion or her her own personal way of helping the poor. So all Jane could really bear to do was write her confidant, uh, Ellen Gates Star. And that's so sweet and so adorable. And like, I can really relate to this because I was actually driving myself crazy before I found film and found out that that was my passion. And I feel like we kind of all go through this exploratory part of our lives where we're just like kind of feel lost is like oh what do I do with my life you know that kind of thing so I feel mm-hmm. like my my poor husband dealt with a lot of that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was searching and it's like oh, oh yeah exactly <laughs> and thankfully I found my passion in high school but I spent a few years mulling about and becoming distraught just like Jane and so I kind of really feel for her mm. with that when I found film, I really knew that that's what I wanted to do with my life, just like Jane knew that she wanted to do this with her life. And my yeah. main goal was the same as Jane. Um, I wanted to help people, and she all she wanted to do was to help people. What Jane found was, of course, not being a doctor, but she knew she was religious, and she knew that God had a different calling on her life. So she searched and searched, and she searched in the many books that she came across. But in 1887, Jane actually read a magazine that featured an article talking about this idea about what is called a settlement house. So these settlement houses actually originated in England. So basically what these houses were, were there were communities in poor suburban areas where volunteer middle-class citizens would all live as a settlement workers, and they would help try and alleviate the poverty of the low-income neighborhood that they were in the middle of. So they would provide services like daycare, schooling, healthcare, all different kinds of things. 
So this really spoke to Jane's heart, and she decided to go and visit for the first settlement house, which is actually in London. Jane took her partner, Ellen, and some others, and together they explored this idea. The more Jane learned, the more she wanted to start her own settlement house, but she kind of kept it a secret. Eventually, she felt guilty for keeping a secret, and she told her partner, Ellen, who loved the idea and agreed to help her start it, which, I mean... She kind of told her, I I'm wonder if, like, Jane told her and was like, do you think this is a good idea? Or she told her asking her to help her. Right. Was like, or if Ellen would just heard this idea and was like, oh, I'm going to help. Like, yes, no, it's not, a, this is not, you right. know, this isn't a, a debate. We're going to do this together. You know, like, I wonder how that conversation exactly. went down. <laughs> and it could have been a mix of all of yeah, them. You know, and like the first one is, I found this idea. This is really cool. Ooh, what do you think about maybe doing something like that? Totally. You know what I mean? It probably like organically evolved yeah. into something. Yeah. So Jane visited the settlement house and it was actually on her own. And she was enchanted. She loved what the community offered. She described it as a community of university men who lived there have their recreation clubs and society all among the poor people, yet in the same style in which they would live in their own circle. It is also free of professional doing good, so unaffectedly sincere, and so productive of good results in these classes and libraries seem perfectly ideal. So it is said that these settlements doubled as community art centers, which is super awesome because yay arts. Absolutely. I, I feel like our culture today is kind of losing the arts but it's really cool to see that people like jane knew the importance of arts and like that was one of their main focuses was the arts to to help grow with the community and their and the children and everything absolutely and they also provided social services these settlement houses were the foundation for many other programs and so when i think of a uh, hull house the, the basic kind of picture in your mind that is the easiest one to think of is that it was the template for YMCA and the Boys and Girls Club today. Um, oh. It's that kind of center, basically. But also, Hull House did a lot more. Now, at first, it was a residence of 25 women, and it would later be a 13-building complex. Wow. And it'd be visited by more than 2,000 people a week. Now... Hull House was located in the very heavy pocket of immigrants in Chicago. Uh, Hull House had, and quote, a night school for adults, clubs for older children, a public kitchen, an art gallery, a gym, a bathhouse, a book bindery, music education, a drama club, apartments, a library, meeting rooms, an employment bureau, and a lunchroom. Oh my gosh. It was really, That's a it had lot. so much. It was such a lifeline to people and especially to the immigrant population because it offered training and it also offered community events. So wow. here's another way to kind of visualize the the neighborhood that Hull House was in. So uh, you've got Hull House in the middle. Right. On the east and on the west, there was the Italian population. Mm -hmm. uh, to the south, it was the German and Jewish population. To the north, it was the Greek and Irish population. And then on the northwest, there was the Canadian French oh population. So you had all these wonderful pockets uh, of groups that would probably normally stick to themselves, right. but they had Hull House in common. It became like their central meeting ground and education right. and recreation that center. That's so cool. <laughs> I want that kind of like diversity yeah. in community. That would be really super awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. And not only the diversity of it, but the centering gathering place, you totally. know what I mean? Yeah. That's the part that's like, okay, that's the magical element oh, um, yeah. uh, that's missing. I found it fascinating. Yeah. Um, I also like how this is uh, worded on the Jane Addams Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. uh, quote, as Hull House grew and the relationship with the neighborhood deepened, that opportunity became less of a comfort to the poor and more of an outlet of expression and an exchange of different cultures and diverse communities. And I just, I wow. thought that that was a perfect way to kind of sum it up. You know, totally, it, it didn't yeah. come just about the poor. It became about the community right. um, and, and that diverseness. And I loved it. Yeah. Now, Hull House was also the center of research and study, and it was in the center of the neighborhood. So residents would actually conduct investigations on housing and midwifery, fatigue, tuberculosis, typhoid fever, oh garbage God. collection, drugs, and truancy. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so 
Basically, if it was affecting the neighborhood in a negative way, the residents were the ones that were coming up with studies and practical solutions. Wow. And it didn't take long for the world to actually kind of take notice of this as well. Yeah. It's like an escalated neighborhood watch type thing, except for when yes, you know, people are actually participating and have responsibilities and such. Yeah. Oh, very much so. Yeah. That's it's really what we cool. would all want the neighborhood watch to be. Yeah, pretty much. This is... <laughs> Hey, Neighborhood Watch, let's be this, okay? Okay. Right. Unfortunately, I know, let's get on this. Yeah, let's get on that, yeah. It's not that easy, (laughs) but uh, we could do it, right? Absolutely. Uh, Well, William Lyon Mackenzie King, which is such a fantastic, fabulous four-part name. (laughs) Yeah, that's a mouthful. (laughs) He came to visit Hull House, and he would actually later become the Prime Minister of Canada. Uh, uh, Julia Lorthrop was a resident at Hull House, and she would become the director of the United States Children Bureau. Also, she was the first woman to ever head a federal bureau, by the way, which is is quite interesting. Yeah, totally. (laughs) Another resident of Hull House was Florence Kelly. She worked against sweatshops and for the minimum wage and for nine hour workdays and also for children's rights, which That's is fantastic. Beautiful. Yeah. All of those yeah. things are super important. Yeah. And they kind of, you know, it's one of those things where it's right place, right time. Were totally. they bred out of Hull House? Maybe. But were they encouraged because of Hull House? Most right. definitely. Yeah. So exactly. yeah. that's the thing that helps. <laughs> yeah. Now, children were also an important focus of Hull House. Adams argued in her book, The Spirit of Youth and the City Streets, that play and recreation programs are needed because cities were destroying the spirit of youth. So the Hull House had multiple programs for kids in art, in language, in reading, and of course, in playtime. Yeah, You gotta have playtime. You got to. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so yep. awesome that you recognize that, or she recognized it, because children... Like, when they're taught things at a young age, you know, they're going to grow up to think those things about themselves, you know. So that's just really cool Mm -hmm. that she encouraged all of those things. That's just amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, one other thing that really helped Hull House was Mary Rosett Smith. Now, Mary was a well-off lady, and she was a student of Ellen Starr's. And when Mary volunteered to teach a kindergarten class at Hull House, Jane and Mary became quite close, and they would be close companions until the end of their lives. Now, Mary was the primary source and emotional support in Jane's life, as well as her critic, uh, her advice giver, and financial support as well. So Jane and Mary's relationship was many of what college-educated women of this time had. Few of chose to marry and instead give their life to work and their female companions. It was the unique environment at Hull House that allowed both men and women to break free of social norms. And I thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, that's really awesome. So in 1901, Jane Adams and her colleagues from Hull House actually started the Juvenile Protective Association. Or the JPA, because that was really hard to say. <laughs> oh, yes, actually. JPA is much easier to say. And it's yeah. it's pretty well known today, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it actually provided the first probation officers for the first juvenile court of the United States until this became a government function, which is incredible to me because, I mean, I yeah. have some knowledge of, you know, probation officers, but just in like the adult world. And I understand right. how important they are. And they're like, they're almost your lifeline. They're, they're your advocate, yeah. you know? So it's hard to imagine that not being a thing, especially for right. children. Like that is a big deal. Absolutely. You know, you c- I can't imagine what it'd be like to not have that system in place. Can you imagine how many juveniles did or would have been misplaced Without this? I mean, that's just crazy. Oh, yeah. Lots of them. Yeah. Yeah. So from 1907 until the 1940s, the JPA engaged in many studies, including subjects like racism, child labor and exploitation, drug abuse, prostitution, all of which they were in Chicago, and all of their effects on child development. So through the years, their mission has now become to improve the social and emotional well-being of vulnerable children so that they can reach their fullest potential when they're at home. These children learn so much at such a young age, and when they're taught that they're bad, they kind of tend to stay bad. I mean, like all kids do. Yeah. 
So the fact that Jane tackled so many issues that she found is just amazing to me because like when I look at social issues, I become really sad. I, I don't know how to fix it. So I kind of tend to stop thinking about it so I can stop feeling for everybody because I feel incredibly deeply. But Jane took all this, all the world events, she processed it in her own mind and she figured out what she could do, and then she just tackled it head on, which is amazing. And I think that one thing that probably helped Jane versus, you know what I mean, kind of us today, Mm -hmm. is that today we are one click away from the entire world. Totally. You know, the World Wide Web connects us in every, every place, even though it's thousands and millions of miles away, it feels like it's our neighbor and there's far more to help and there's far more situations to do. But Jane was focusing on Chicago. She was focusing on the problems that were on the street corner of her house, basically. And I think that helps. I think that helps to have the forward thinking of, I can help this, (laughs) at least. I can help my neighborhood. Beyond that... It might be a little bit too far, but this block I can I can work on. <laughs> Absolutely. And that, that kind of almost micromanaging instead of macromanaging the world, you know? Yes. I feel like that, like you said, maybe that helped a lot because you can, you can help your neighbor. You can, like, help somebody next mm-hmm. to you, but it's so hard to comprehend how do you help somebody who's halfway around the world. Well, if you help your neighbor... You can maybe even give a template of other people to help their neighbors, and then it can kind of create this ripple effect, which makes way more sense instead of being Mm -hmm. so overwhelmed with everything like I tend to do. (laughs) I mean... (laughs) We all do. We all do. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I always go with, you know, know, wanting to change the world. Well, the world is what you define it. So if you're defining the whole globe or whether you're defining the people that you can actually help. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what is your circle of your world? Right. Um, and do what you can there. And then, yeah, those ripples. The ripples are amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> when I first heard you say that quote, actually, it really, like, touched me. Because I was going through this. I was like, I, I heard you just say that. And I was like, oh, well, that makes more sense. Because, like, <laughs> I feel... Don't take on too I'm, much. I'm yeah. trying to take on literally the world. And uh, that's kind of not working out. So what do I do? (laughs) Exactly. Define the world by the people that you know, that you influence and that influence you. That's your world. Totally. Totally. (laughs) Yeah. But she did tons more stuff at Hull House and beyond, didn't she? She did. So Jane and her colleagues at Hull House also documented typhoid fever. And they reported that poor workers were actually bearing the brunt of the illness, which kind of makes sense, unfortunately. So, oh, yes. Yeah. So she actually called out those in higher power who were ignorant to their health and they were ignoring it and they're ignoring helping with the sanitation and building codes and all this stuff. And Adams spoke out and she said, quote, undoubted powers of public mm-hmm. recreation to bring together the classes of the community and the keeping them apart. So Adams worked with the Chicago Board of Health and served as the first vice president of the Playground Association of America. I love that there's such a thing. <laughs> I do too. That's like, that sounds fun, question mark. Playground Association. Right, the Playground Association. Right. Yes. I love it. <laughs> but also, I mean, I, she's got she's got fun and health. Like the Chicago Board of Health and the Playground Association. Right. I mean, she's not messing around. She, right. she is there to help with the recreation and health. It's quite amazing. Yeah. I love it. I do too. So if that all wasn't enough, in 1912, Jane actually published a book called A New Conscious and Ancient Evil about prostitution. So this book was actually extremely popular at the time because it was published in a more well-known time period of the white slave trade, which kind of hits home to me because slavery, this type of slavery, still exists today. This was one of the topics that I used for my first uh long format films this kind of hits home to me too yeah very cool it's very interesting that we have a uh, similar viewpoints and things that we are tackling i guess right exactly oh absolutely this is something that needs to be addressed and brought to awareness totally. <laughs> yep and solved, solved. oh my yeah. goodness and oh solved gosh, yes yeah. <laughs> 
Now, when it comes to women's rights, uh, Jane was a large supporter, though because of her friendship with philosopher John Dewey, she felt that women's rights, it was more about duty and less about the actual rights of women, which is, you know, there there's either side of the coin you can go right. on with that. Uh, but Jane's hill to kind of die on was when it came to duty. Um, and Jane was influential of the middle and upper class uh, of women to use their leisure to become involved with what she called civic housekeeping. Uh, There was a woman's club at Hull House, and in 1894, they reported 1,000 health department violations to the city council, and they reduced death and disease in their communities. Quite amazing. amazing. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) Yeah. She, they took it upon themselves. Yeah. And in 1915, she was elected the national chairman of the Women's Peace Party. And she attended the International Congress of Women at The Hague in April. The meeting of 10 countries was an effort to end World War I, which at this time the U.S. was not yet entered. We would be two more years before the U.S. involvement in World War I. Right. Now, Emily Block actually wrote this about Jane at that event. She said, quote, Miss Adam shines, so respectful of everyone's views, so eager to understand and sympathize, so patient with the anarchy and even ego, yet always there, strong, wise, and in the lead, no managing, no keeping dark, no bringing things subtly to pass, just a radiating wisdom and power of judgment. Wow. That is an, a remarkable thing to say that about really another person. Is. I... <laughs> I wouldn't mind if something like that was said about me someday. That's pretty amazing. I, I, that's Absolutely. actually one of my favorite. That's my favorite quote from this episode. It's just too long to put on a meme. So, <laughs> right, exactly, absolutely, yes. That's that is a, a painted picture of basically of Jane. Totally. <laughs> Yeah. Now, however, not everybody thought that Jane was a shining example of wisdom and judgment. Her speech on pacifism that year at Carnegie Hall got negative coverage by the papers, and even the New York Times branded her as unpatriotic. Oh, now, to to remember what pacifism is, because it is, you know, it took me a bit. I actually had to look it up and make sure. But it is a person who believes that war and violence are unjustifiable. So therefore, a war is not an end to any means, basically. Right. <laughs> Now, she continued with the Hague Congress until 1919, and then it developed into the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And that actually leads into something very interesting that happened to her around 1931. What was that, Phoebe? So, although Jane was actually criticized, she eventually was recognized and even rewarded for the many things she did. In 1931, she was the first U.S. woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, and Jane was awarded for her, quote, expression of an essentially American democracy, which counteracts all those negative things, which is pretty, sounds a little more accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So. Uh, Criticize me all you want. I now have a Nobel Peace Prize. Pretty much. (laughs) Like. Talk to the hand. I mean, what? Uh, okay. Anyway. <laughs> exactly. Right. But yeah, 1931 style. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so she actually donated um, half of her share of the prize money to the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Of course, when she gets a prize for just herself, she has to give it right back. Um, because that's just the kind of lady she was, and that's why we like her. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. She knew that they could do a lot more work for peace and freedom and needed totally. the money and needed the funds and to get it going. I love totally. that. It's so awesome. So although Jane received the prize in 1931, she was not actually able to attend the ceremony. She was very ill due, a, due to a heart attack a few years beforehand, and she never actually fully recovered from it, which puzzled the doctors. Her doctor actually recommended that she not travel to receive her Nobel Peace Prize. Yeah. So Mary was actually at Jane's side during her heart attack and her recovery. Historians say that Mary neglected her own health while she was taking care of Jane. And in 1934, Mary actually died of pneumonia after 40 years together with Jane. And Jane was too sick to attend her memorial service. So the memorial was held in their home so that Jane could hear from the second floor room, which is adorable and sad sad. and like, aw. Yeah. I feel for them. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Absolutely. My heart goes out. Yeah. So Jane would actually die a year later after an operation revealed that she actually had cancer and no one knew it. Oh, tragedy. Yeah. Oh, so when it comes to the the legacy that Jane wanted to leave behind, right. I actually found this entry from the Hull House Museum. Completely fascinating and, of course, just right on. Uh, they write, when Jane Addams and Ellen Gate Starr first opened Hull House in 1889, they had very modest goals. They imagined a place to offer art and literary education to less fortunate neighbors. The role of Hull House quickly grew beyond what either Gates or Adams could ever have imagined and continuously evolved to meet the needs of their neighbors. Aww, so I love that. Yeah. I like that it started with modest goals, you know, totally. and it just kind of grew over time and it became this voice for world peace. Um, it really does feel like that organic development into a legacy of helping neighbors wow. uh, near and far. Now, it does sadden me when it comes to her legacy that in 1963, many of the buildings of Hull House were destroyed because of the construction of the University of Illinois campus. However, happily, two buildings remain and it is a museum today. And I was actually hoping to visit before this podcast, but I couldn't make it there. So I am adding it to my travel list for sure. Um, And I hope that anybody out there that can go visit does go visit as well. (laughs) I think it shall be added onto my list as well. Maybe we should go together or something, like, because that's pretty awesome. Chicago trip of fun to go see and experience and be where Jane was. And it's so funny (laughs) that the buildings that remain are, like, directly in the center of the campus, because that just encompasses Yeah, they're still totally on campus. and they're right in the middle of everything. (laughs) It's like, oh, well, that makes sense. Where else would it be? (laughs) And not only is it a museum, but it's still part of the college uh, community. There are still women's groups that meet at Hull House that are part of the university. So So I thought that was very cool. So Phoebe, what legacy do you think she wanted to leave behind? Well, I kind of just wanted to echo what you said about the fact that they started with humble beginnings. They didn't really, she didn't really have this big goal to like be this big, important, you know, public figure and win a Nobel Peace Prize like I don't she didn't start out with that in mind you know Mm -hmm. and I think that that's that's pretty cool and um very modest beginnings and very she her legacy I wonder at all if she even thought that she would leave a legacy I think she just wanted to help yeah I'm not sure she would yeah Yeah. I think she yeah I'm with you totally she just wanted to help people she just wanted to be there And I think eventually, as time grew on, she realized that she could leave a legacy because of how much she did. Mm -hmm. So much. So I think... At some point, you do got to look back at your life and be like, wow, I did a lot. Right. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So after that point, I think the legacy that, that she wanted to leave behind was people helping people. Like, you can... Everybody, like, help their own communities. Because if we all reached out in our own community, the world would be so much better already. And I I think that she just wanted to accentuate the goodness in people and and just spread the help and love to to everybody, you know. Well said. (laughs) Now, what I learned personally from Jane, I learned that money helps. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. (laughs) Granted, it's... (laughs) It's something I knew, but also it was reinforced in Jane. I know it really helps, Um, especially with Jane, because she was creating a job that didn't exist yet in the United States. So money helps for that. So what Jane did for social work and for settlement houses, um, she was in a position where very few were. And she was at a time when very few people could take ambitious steps like this and make Hull House a reality. So I'm very grateful. Grateful um, that she had the financial opportunity as well as the encouragement, right. um, you know, from her family and friends to make it a reality. So, also because of researching Jane this week, I actually kind of accidentally, serendipitously, I have no idea how, uh, I came to a life affirming realization. Um, I realized that my life has been centered around one particular constant thing, and that is learning from broken people. Uh, First, it was movies. Um, It's easier, of course, in movies to learn from broken people because you meet a character, they get broken, and then in some way, by the end of the movie, they're either fixed or they're on the road to being fixed, right? Right, exactly. (laughs) 
Now, books do this as well, but because I'm a visual learner, I was more relating to movies, but I was also seeing this in books as well. And now when I say broken people, I mean it in the way that we're all broken in some way. All of us are. Whether it's childhood trauma, adult hardships, skills we feel like we're lacking, or opportunities that have never come our way. Um, So when I learn from another person who has made a trail, where the odds were against them, and they still not only blazed a trail, but they made a trail available to others, I learn from that and I gravitate towards them. And what I try to do is incorporate some element, some little kernel of what they learned and what they went through into my life to make my life better and to make me slightly less of a broken person. That's so cool. (laughs) Oh, thank you. (laughs) So learning from broken people who have succeeded And succeeded in quotes, basically, because succeeding is your determination. You determine what succeeding is. Um, But for people who have succeeded and made the world better in one way or another, and then just sharing those stories, learning from broken people who have overcome. It's my way of helping without becoming a doctor. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Just like Jane, right? I mean, it's small, but I think when Jane started out, she thought what she she was doing was small and goodness it did it grow yeah. <laughs> um now i don't know if a uh, gal's guide will grow as much as hull house but i will let you know i sure am studying it more oh totally oh my gosh <laughs> and i will see what gal's guide can learn from the amazing jane because there there is a lot i think we still need uh, a whole house in in all major communities to, to bring communities together. Yeah, and we almost need a, I feel like we almost need a rebirthing of these types of things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. More than just a community rec center, right. but a, you know, a community uh, center with art and discussion yeah. and study and research and let's make our community better right. together. Yeah. So I think, I, I think we've been missing it yeah. for a long time now. So. <laughs> yeah. So what I learned from Jane was I kind of learned that even though I'm just quote uh, just a single woman, I can impact the world too. Yes. Um, There's so many things happening in the world and I just feel so sad and depressed a lot and I just, that I can't do anything about it. Except that Jane taught me that I can do something about it. And I also came to this realization last night. There's so many things about Jane that I love and I appreciate and she did so much for the world and it was like, I wonder if I was having a disconnect with her because what she was tackling was things that I was ignoring about myself about because she was tackling social issues uh-huh. and all these things and those are things that I've kind of been, I noticed but I'm not really like seeing kind of back burner like i'm gonna get to you but i can't right now yeah i'm with you right and so i i kind of i what i saw in her i was avoiding seeing in myself and so it was kind of like shying away from her but i i think that that's why i had a hard time so now it's like she's forcing me to reconnect with that part of myself it's like okay here we go (laughs) like buckle up jane is waking you up oh yeah (laughs) yep (laughs) i like it yes (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Oh, that is lovely. Oh, perfect. (laughs) Well, that wraps it up for us. Thank you so much for listening to Your Gal Friday. You can find out more about Jane Addams and the upcoming gals that we're going to be covering at galsguide.org. If you like the show and find value in the gals that we cover, subscribe, share, and visit our Patreon page. Links to everything are at galsguide.org. We leave you with this quote from Jane. True peace is not merely the absence of war. It is the presence of justice. For more information about this week's gal or to check out our previous episodes, visit galsguide.org. To support the show, visit the Gals Guide Patreon page. We've got great perks like behind the scenes, early access, and private live streams. Thank you so much for subscribing to Your Gal Friday.